Today's podcast of Hellbent for Horror is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash hellbent for horror. Audible has over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hi, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror. I'm S.A. Bradley, and I'm a lifelong movie lover, but my heart belongs to horror. My biggest thrill, however, is getting to talk to people about this stuff. I really want to start conversations with you. I wanted to take a moment to say thank you to some of the listeners who reached out to ask questions or share their own stories. Listener Doug Lipsky contacted me in response to episode 14 entitled, We're Dealing with Volatile Substance. Doug's comment, I liked your angle on Dirty Harry as a horror film. In my humble opinion, sudden impact is Dirty Harry dropped into I Spit on Your Grave or Miss 45. Now, for those of you uninitiated, Sudden Impact is the fourth movie in the Dirty Harry franchise. It's about a gang rape victim who starts stalking and killing rapists one by one. Doug, I can certainly see the similarities. Myself, I prefer Abel Ferrara's Miss 45 which is full of real rage, and and it's also pretty visually stunning for a low-budget film. Listener Scott Lamond also sent me a movie he felt was a horror film in disguise. Scott said, We need to talk about Kevin. That's the name of the movie. Twin parent horrors of A, not connecting with your child, and B, worrying about them turning out to be horrible. Scott, I really like the mood of that film, and to me, it is 100% a horror movie. I don't know why anybody would watch it and want to call it something else. I also heard from Mike Vittorio, who said, I just listened to episode one, First Kiss. My first kiss was Pet Cemetery. We had a mean black cat in the house when I watched. I was eight years old. Thanks, Mike. I'm sure it was a scary experience for you, especially with that black cat there. But even without the cat, Watching a movie where a boy about the same age as you gets killed must have been pretty traumatic. And I will say that the movie Pet Cemetery was a reasonably faithful adaptation of Stephen King's novel. I mean, it includes all the big set pieces that were in the story, and the screenplay is even written by Stephen King. And yet, the movie isn't the novel. It's missing the really, really dark stuff that makes Pet Cemetery, in my opinion, the most disturbing Stephen King book he ever wrote. And the really, really dark stuff that's missing in the movie is not something supernatural, but it is the monster at the center of everything. It is described by one character in a single sentence. The heart of a man is stonier. The heart in question here belongs to the main character, Lewis Creed. It's a true telltale heart. And like Edgar Allan Poe's story, we are privy to the thoughts inside the main character's head. So no matter how Lewis acts in front of others, we know what's really going on inside him. Lewis may act like he's a family man who is conflict-free, but he secretly hates who he has become, and he blames his family and others for it. He is a self-absorbed, middle-class doctor who resents his wife and his daughter and his wife's family for the choices that he's made in his life. The only person Lewis adores is his son, Gage. He sees the younger version of himself, really. He fantasizes about leaving his wife and daughter and taking Gage to start a new life. Lewis is infested with midlife rage. He resents that he's done all the right things for all the wrong reasons. In a way, he's like Walter White from Breaking Bad. He's only good because of the lack of other options. He is ripe for temptation from evil. And when he is tempted, the result is that he watches his entire family die, and he knows that he is responsible for it all. Did you know that Stephen King originally shelved the book because he, his wife, and fellow horror novelist Peter Straub felt he went too far, that it was too dark. But King needed to complete his contract with Doubleday, so he pulled it out of the trash can. It was a major hit, much to King's surprise, and his chagrin. I'm sure that Stephen King felt that Pet Cemetery was too dark in some part to its being so much about death, especially the death of children. 
But I'll wager that it was just as much, if not more, because of the stony heart of Lewis Creed, because that is a cold, indifferent, and all too real evil, and frighteningly relatable. No matter how much grief and self-loathing comes to him, there is no redemption possible. And the movie can only hint at that truly dark center of the book. These are horrible inner thoughts that don't translate easily to film. So when people talk about horror movies adapted from novels, I usually ask two questions. Did you read the book before you saw the movie? Did the movie get you to read the book? Movies and books both have their own unique and special powers in storytelling. Sometimes a good book makes a bad movie. Sometimes a bad book makes a good movie. And sometimes one book can give birth to a bunch of good movies, and they don't even really resemble the book or even each other. In the end, it's the story that attracts us and engages us. Books were my first savior, and books were my first corrupter. In my first podcast episode, I spoke about The First Kiss, the movie that started our lifelong obsessions with horror. One of the key things about The First Kiss was that it broke through our parents' carefully structured world that they made to protect us. Any horror we got was court-appointed horror, stuff that passed our parents' inspection before we could even get near it. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I had my first kiss, I blew it. When I got that first taste of real horror, that forbidden fruit, I did not keep cool. I had horrible nightmares, and my dad had to come and console me. I unintentionally ratted out my first kiss. From then on, I could only watch horror movies under his supervision, which made getting my second kiss a lot harder, and boy, did I want that second kiss. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Carrie and The Exorcist were in the movie theaters. My father let me know I would never, ever see these movies. But little did my dad know that I had already let the barbarians through the gates, and it happened right under his nose. My corruption started when I became an avid reader. I was a voracious reader as a kid, and my dad supported me learning to read early on. See, my father was functionally illiterate until, as family legend says, he started reading comic strips to me at bedtime. My dad felt that not knowing how to read held him back as an adult. He didn't understand the appeal of a good book but he understood the power of reading. So he bought me a set of Funkin' Wagnalls encyclopedias. From then on, my dad's favorite answer to any question I had was, look it up. And that became my favorite thing to do, looking it up. I know, I know. If you're not an avid reader, you're probably thinking that spending days reading encyclopedias is a form of torture. But this was the perfect smokescreen a seemingly innocent academic exercise that covered up my crimes. See, to my dad, a book was a book was a book. It all looked like homework to him. So when I started reading more and more fiction, the encyclopedias came in handy. The dictionary that I asked for became invaluable because I never had to go up to my dad and ask what the word pudendum meant. I didn't have to ask how you disemboweled somebody or what an intestine looked like. I just looked it up. The first book I ever stole was an anthology called Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbinders in Suspense. It was from the library in my elementary school. I have no idea why I felt the need to steal a book I could borrow for free. I opened the book and saw the illustrations and the stories and I wanted to have it forever. I just walked out of the library with it when the bell rang. It was the perfect crime. The stories in the book were abridged classics, but they were a great starter for me. I was introduced to Robert Block with Yours Truly, Jack the Ripper. I was absolutely fascinated by Road Dahl's Man from the South. Now, that was a story about an arrogant young man getting caught in a dangerous gamble. The Man from the South bets him that the young man's trusty Zippo lighter can't light ten times in a row without missing. If the Zippo misses, the man chops off the young man's pinky. The man from the South has a collection of 47 pinkies. (laughs) But the single most important story was The Birds by Daphne du Maurier. I had seen Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds on television, and it scared me. But I figured that reading it would be no problem for me since I knew it would happen. And this was when I found out that a movie and a book can be two different things, even when they were the same story. Du Maurier's story 
was much darker. It was end of the world stuff. Jet fighters were falling out of the sky, and it was gorier. A farmer was trampled into a gooey paste by his cows, and his body was just left there. Just like the movie, there were no answers as to why this was all happening. But the way DeMarier wrote the story, it was full of the dread of people trying to wake up from a nightmare. Neither the movie nor the book were bad. They were just different. But the book got under my skin. That made an impression. So I knew what I needed to do. The next week, I stole Alfred Hitchcock's ghostly gallery from the library. Now, I don't want to say that literature leads to a life of crime, but I'm also not saying that it doesn't. See, non-readers usually look at reading as an esoteric little parlor art or on the same par as sipping tea from a set of bone china. No, no, no. Reading and writing are dirty and vicious and ruthless art forms. Every vulgar word or sex act that subverted my parents' safe world I read in a book first. I was learning more about the bigger world than I was supposed to be. And sometimes what I read contradicted my parents. My parents introduced me to a very black and white world. Books introduced me to gray. And then all the colors. Reading books will turn you from a shoplifter into an international cat burglar. A lot of my education happened through what I call the potato chip effect. I would look something up in the dictionary or the encyclopedia usually something dirty, and when I'd find it, the definition would mention another subject, so I'd look that up too, and then something else would catch my eye. It was like potato chips. I couldn't eat just one fact. I wanted the whole bag. And that's why the first two books I ever stole were so influential to me. I got introduced to writers I fell in love with, like Algernon Blackwood and Roald Dahl and Robert Block, and I went on to read a lot of their work. But also, I found out that many of the stories were made into movies, and I found out that a lot of movies were books first. Once I fell in love with horror, I needed to find a way to get around my dad so I could still experience the good stuff. So if my dad wouldn't let me see the movies, maybe I could sneak the books in and read them. The first novel I remember doing that with was Peter Benchley's Jaws. Anyone who read that book knows that there's a whopper of a sex scene in there. I kind of forgot about the shark for a while. And anyone who read the book also knows it wasn't a very good book. Apologies to the late Peter Benchley, but the book was pretentious and the ending was a real anticlimax. I read the book and I saw the movie in the same week. And Jaws gave me a lesson in just how a movie can be so much more effective than the source material. Because this story is primal, like a shark. It was made for visual storytelling because it's all gut feeling. That story needed to be released from words and let cello strings take over. And I think that's why it's one of the best horror films ever made. Now, as my reading consumption went up, I realized I was going to have to go legit. I got a library card. I was able to borrow up to seven books at a time for two weeks for free. There were thousands of books to choose from and actual science fiction horror sections. There were dozens of big city newspapers and microfiche for dozens of magazines. So I could do research on the authors of the stories without ever leaving the library. The bonus was that getting seven books at a time, I was going to be able to hide a risky one in that pile. I smuggled Carrie into my bedroom that way and Salem's Lot. Now, in the late 70s and early 80s, Stephen King's books were almost always already out on loan. And that's where having a dedicated horror section came in really handy. I got into Ramsey Campbell and Peter Straub and Charles L. Grant's Shadows anthologies. Yeah, I tip my hat to the labeling of genres just for this purpose, just this once. I know, it sounds like all I did was go to the library and read or go home to my room and read, right? Yeah. I locked myself away after my parents' divorce and after some public humiliation around my parents' controversial religion. I really was no fun to be around anyway. To tell you the truth, I didn't think I fit in anywhere at all. I was the weird kid at school. I was the weird cousin in my family. I was the weird son at home. And I didn't know what I believed in anymore. Why didn't I connect to the black and white world of my parents anymore? What was wrong with me? I really didn't know who I was. 
I think that outsider mentality is why I connected so much with the Frankenstein monster. When I read the book and I found out that the creature learned to read and speak after being abandoned, it felt really resonant. And then movies like Invasion of the Body Snatchers really spoke to me too. Not knowing who you are or losing your identity to a more powerful group was scary. And it was a visit to the science fiction section looking for Jack Finney's The Body Snatchers that led me to find the book that changed my life. I talk a lot about that first kiss, the movie or book that started a lifelong obsession. This book is not the first kiss. This book is more like the energy given off by a flame that boils a pan of water to heat the food that will feed you. Or the steam that makes a locomotive hurl down the tracks and up the mountains. This book gave me the energy and the passion and the drive to just keep going. This book gave me the permission to stay curious and the permission to stay smart and to know it's okay to think differently, to be different. It legitimized me. It gave me the power to give a shit. That book was Again Dangerous Visions, edited by Harlan Ellison. Again Dangerous Visions was a sequel to an anthology experiment that Harlan Ellison created for science fiction fantasy writers that he called Dangerous Visions. These anthologies offer a spot for the authors to write an original story without concerns over taboos or publishing restrictions. Now, because boundaries were being intentionally pushed, the stories are hit and miss. And what is considered a taboo is pretty subjective as well. But when the right provocative thought connects with you, walls come down. The story that broke down the walls for me was Time Travel for Pedestrians by Ray Nelson. Some horror fans might recognize that name from Nelson's short story, Eight O'Clock in the Morning, which John Carpenter's They Live was based on. So, the story that changed me, what was it about? And here's where I may lose some of you. Because ostensibly, ostensibly, if you read the story in a literal standard narrative, it's the story of a man who takes morning glory seeds to hallucinate while he masturbates to a recording of the first bardo of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Oh, and he travels through time in his hallucinations. The first line of the story is this. Masturbation fantasy is the last frontier. Is this thing on? Hello? (laughs) Now, that first line might have made me slam the book shut, but it didn't because I saw the statement right after it. When we travel to other planets, we won't find much that we can't see or guess at from here. But there are things so strange we can hardly get the fingers of our minds around them that are closer to us than our own skin. I realized he was talking about how little we actually know ourselves or understand ourselves or accept ourselves. There's a self that we project to others and there's a self we project to ourselves that we can accept. But are we really being ourselves? Are we really seeing ourselves? Are we being truthful with ourselves? And Nelson ingeniously uses something simple, something you never think about, something so personal you'd never share with another person or even dwell on it yourself to make his point. What do you think of when you jack off? What are those dirty pictures inside your head mean that are so important that your mind replays them every single time? What are you deep down? Know thyself might be the most terrifying thing possible. Are you thinking of that dirty movie now? Ray Nelson thought you might, and so he wrote this. Look at it. Study it as if it were a masterpiece of art. Meditate on it like it were the words of a great teacher. For it is the one thing in the universe you've made for yourself alone, not to impress someone else, or gain the approval of the church, or government, or respectable community. It may well be the only doorway that will ever open to allow you entrance into your own inner self. And then he says, Why do you hang back? 
Why is it so scary to own your own identity? Why are we more comfortable to wear the identity that people require of us? In Nelson's story, our time traveler is at times a woman and at times a man through history. He travels to times in history where violent religious conflict is constantly raging, and our character is always caught in the middle of the struggle. Allegedly, it's the struggle for men's souls. But we see that it's a struggle over who owns the power to write history. It is a struggle over who owns information and who controls knowledge. And he who controls knowledge controls the people. And that struggle repeats itself over and over through time. Our main character may be a time traveler, but there's a catch. He can't just click his heels and transport to the next era. He can only travel after he dies. And he usually dies horribly and tragically. In every life, the character tries to appease whatever master is in front of him. In every life, there's an opportunity to follow someone telling the real truth, and he either betrays that person or fails them. No matter which side he takes, he is killed by the master he tries to appease. In one life, he's a pagan woman who is killed while having sex with a horned god. In another life, he's a peasant boy who's killed because he doesn't kiss the cross held out by a wandering Templar. In another life... He is a French boy during the Inquisition who turns in his father and sister as heretics so he can become educated as a priest and he becomes an inquisitor. But he is so tortured by his betrayal and the Inquisitions that he denounces the church on his deathbed and he dies damned. However, the most powerful story takes place in the Jewish quarter of Alexandria during the reign of Emperor Vespasian just 30 years after the crucifixion of Christ. It's probably the most controversial story, and for a 12-year-old who was punished on both sides by a black-and-white ideology, it was the most liberating. Now, the city of Alexandria is a war zone full of factions of Jews, Greeks, and Roman soldiers. They're all fighting guerrilla warfare on the streets of a city immersed in a power struggle. There are mad prophets on every street corner, but the story of Jesus is catching on. And just like a modern phenomenon, the apostles are all getting book deals to tell the story of the Savior. Our main character is a scribe for the Great Library of Alexandria, and his superiors want him to get the story of Mad Mary from Magdala, better known as Mary Magdalene. His superiors feel that if they can back the story of the Messiah of peace, it can be used as a political tool to hold down the fanatical rebelliousness of the Jews. Our scribe ventures into the dangerous and violent slums where Mad Mary lives. When he first meets Mary, he is as cynical as any of the scribes working with the apostles. The twelve of them have conflicting stories that contain questionable miracles that the writers are going to have to fix later in editing. But it quickly becomes apparent to our scribe that he is seated with the only true believer, the only one who saw Jesus as a man touched equally by madness and greatness. Her Jesus wanted to break down a system that was owned by priests and emperors because God was in everyone and was not to be owned by anyone. So she is horrified when she hears, that the apostles are writing books. Mad Mary says, If Jesus wanted a book written, he would have written it himself. It was to free us from a book that he took on flesh. He died to free us from a book. I still get chills from that. Because these were thoughts that I had, but couldn't say out loud. This was the true part of myself I didn't want to look at that I wouldn't share with another person out of fear or shame. This was the one thing in the universe that I thought for myself alone, not to impress someone else. And I certainly wouldn't gain the approval of my church. This was being true to my innermost self. This was me getting honest. Ray Nelson had found the equivalent of the dirty movies in my mind. And there was my taboo thought, written down by someone else for anyone to see. And suddenly, I wasn't alone anymore. I wasn't the sole owner of this taboo thought. I was freed from the shame I put on myself. 
I no longer was just the weird kid at school. I no longer was just the weird cousin in my family. I was no longer just the weird son at home. Now I was me. And there was more to learn. This was a quiet revolution. Well, it was quiet for a little while at least. Another very important book to me was William Peter Blatty's The Exorcist. Now, this movie was considered very dangerous stuff in my house, especially since my parents believed that demons were around all of us. I still kind of believed it too. So I was forbidden to watch the movie, of course. So I read the book. Now, The Exorcist is one of those rare stories where the movie is very faithful to the novel, and they are both exceptional. Both are intense and draining experiences, and both are quite scary. But to me, the novel is just darker and more frightening. In fact, I'll go to the movie and I'll watch that several times before I'll ever go back to the book. And some of that is because of the nature of reading over viewing. In the movie, you only need to endure this world for two hours. With a book, you're immersed for a few days. And something that lasts 10 seconds in the movie could last five pages in the book. Like The Possession. The Possession goes on for months in the book. You feel the futility the characters feel. The demon threatens Reagan's life constantly by slowing down her pulse at will or keeping her awake screaming for days. Blatty's writing spares you nothing. I had to read the book late at night after I was sure everyone was asleep. The first edition cover had a very blurry picture of a little girl looking up at you, and it looked like she had no pupils. There are a few differences in the novel uh, that terrified me that weren't in the 1973 movie, and they're things like this. The first page of the novel is not connected to the story at all. There is no explanation for its inclusion. The first paragraph is from the Bible, Luke chapter 8, verses 27 through 30, where Jesus meets the possessed man who claims he is legion, one of many. Then we have a transcript of an FBI wiretap of two Cosa Nostra members laughing about the torture and murder of a man named William Jackson. They hung him on a meat hook for three days. Then they splashed water on him and hit him with a cattle prod. They laughed that he was so fat he bent the meat hook. Then we're told how Vietnamese soldiers came upon a schoolhouse where children were praying. They drove eight nails into a priest's skull, then sliced off the teacher's tongue, and then they jammed chopsticks into all the children's ears. I could feel evil covering my bedroom like dust. And then came the passage in the book, that came to be known as the spider walk. It comes out of nowhere. Blatty wrote this. Gliding spider-like, rapidly, close behind Sharon, her body arched backward in a bow, with her head almost touching her feet, was Reagan, her tongue flicking quickly in and out of her mouth while she hissed sibilantly like a serpent. Sharon, Chris said numbly, still staring at Reagan. Sharon stopped. So did Reagan. Sharon turned and saw nothing, and then screamed as she felt Reagan's tongue snaking out at her ankle. Wherever Sharon moved, Reagan would follow. I felt that tongue when I read that for the first time. Unfortunately, it was the last thing I was able to read that night. I needed to hide the book in my bedroom and try to get sleep and go to school in the morning. I really did try to get some sleep. Reading The Exorcist in my bedroom was like a dare to myself. This was a test of the black and white world. I woke up unpossessed, and another wall came down. There are times that I wish I could experience the feelings I got from the first 100 books I ever read. It's the same with the first 100 movies, too. I still love a good book, and I can get lost in the world of a great book, but I rarely feel the surprise or wonderment of the early days of reading, back before I became accustomed to story structure and I learned the patterns of authors, or I could notice how derivative a story was to another one. 
I wanted to go back to the time when I wanted to taste all the forbidden fruit just to find out what ones were sweet and what ones were bitter. That learning process. Each book was playing a small part or sometimes a big part in putting together my personality and what I liked and what I stood for. And that's why the books I've talked about, whether the critics or anyone else thinks they're terrible, are great and powerful to me. And with that said, Shirley Jackson, Ray Bradbury, Mary Shelley, Algernon Blackwood, Robert Block, Ray Nelson, Harlan Ellison, Stephen King, Jack Finney, William Golding, Daphne du Maurier, Roald Dahl, William Peter Blatty, Ramsey Campbell, Peter Straub, Charles L. Grant, Clive Barker, Edgar Allan Poe, H.P. Lovecraft, F. Marion Crawford, and Robert Arthur. Thank you. And the authors of the new books that keep me learning, they keep challenging what I think I believe. Dan Simmons, Laura Bucus, Joe Hill, Neil Gaiman, Dean Kuntz, Justin Cronin, Joe R. Lansdale, Thomas Harris, David Wong, and a special ring of hell for two writers who wrote despair so clearly and precisely that I was furious with them after I read their books. And that's a good thing. That's high praise. Cormac McCarthy for Blood Meridian and Jack Ketchum for The Girl Next Door. Thank you. Thank you for corrupting me. Sincerely. I hope I can pay it forward. I think I'd make a good corrupter. Thanks for listening to my show. I'd love to hear back from you. Tell me who corrupted you. Show no shame. You can email me directly at scott at hellbentforhorror.com. And I've also updated my Hellbent for Horror website, conveniently named hellbentforhorror.com, relatively easy to remember if you're a fan of the show. You can download every episode directly from there read any newsletters, and you can go to any of my social websites and emails all from the homepage. That means you can IM me on my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhar, or you can find it on the webpage. And you can find me on Twitter at hellbenthar. A lot of great conversations I have with fans happens on Twitter at hellbenthar. I'd love to find out if I got anyone to read a book after they heard this episode. And because of that, I'm happy to talk to you about an offer from Audible.com. For you, the listeners of Hellbent for Heart, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. I will tell you, most of the books I mentioned can be found on Audible. There is the 40-year anniversary edition of The Exorcist, read by William Peter Blatty, if you got the guts. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash hellbentforhar. If you like the show and you're curious about audiobooks, sign up for the service through Hellbent for Har. It helps make this podcast sustainable for me. I thank you in advance. And really, thanks for listening, folks. Hellbent for Har was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can subscribe to Hellbent for Har on iTunes and Stitcher and Google Play. And if you like the show, please consider writing a review on either iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play. It really helps. And now, until next time, stay hell-bent.